Well, here we are. This is the uh, Friday Q&A, which currently is not every single Friday. I kind of am doing it every other Friday because um, I'm so busy. <laughs> I'm so incredibly busy. It hurts. So i um, doing that every other Friday so that I can use one of the Fridays every other week as a study day. Anyway, the first question for today, which you guys are probably interested in, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about stuff. There it is. That's what I was trying to do. Is this one here um, coming in from... Brijesh Joshi, who who says, much appreciation for the ministry. How were the disciples able to follow Jesus and resist sin without the Spirit indwelling them? Is it possible to be a Christian without the Spirit? Um, two di different questions, but let's dig into those things. First off, I want to challenge a presupposition that we might have going on here behind your question, that the disciples didn't didn't sin when they were following Jesus or even after uh, Jesus' resurrection. But during the time when he was on the earth, the idea that the disciples didn't sin seems wrong. The There's actually strong reasons to think this is the case. And it's, you know, Jesus rebukes the disciples. He rebukes Peter, says, get behind me, Satan. He rebukes the disciples for arguing amongst themselves about which one of them is the greatest. That's kind of a big deal. He calls them, oh, ye of little faith. Um, and so he reprimands them on a number of occasions, not to mention like just other events where you don't have a specifically a word from Jesus that what they did was wrong, but there's, there's, there's something going on there. The disciples were in a learning process. Uh, this doesn't mean everything they did was wrong, but I, I think it would be wrong to think they didn't sin, but maybe you're asking like, how did they ever not sin without the spirit indwelling them? How, like if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, isn't everything you do sinful? Is there anything you do that's truly good, that's morally good and upright? And I think that scripture actually suggests that the answer to that question is also going to be yes. Like there are times where you actually do morally good things, although I'm going to qualify this. So hang with me here for the full explanation. You do morally good things even when you're not a Christian. And Romans 2 is where I want to go. So let's take a look at this. Um, so in Romans 2... It talks about, um, ah, here we go. I, I mean, I should have found the verse before I jumped on. I was like going to the last second here before the live stream. I apologize for that. But this, the Q&A, just so those who don't know, the Q&A is my off the top of my head answers. Um, if you find them fruitful, great. I, I hope that it's helpful for you. But it's not like my sit down and refine my answers. I would never be able to answer 20 questions if I spent like a day or two on each one, which is what I would do if I get them ahead of time. Um, so here, this one, it says, for it is not the hearers of the law, verse 13 of Romans 2, who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, I have a whole teaching on this, Romans 2. This is what I call the most misunderstood or misused passage in the book of Romans. So it's not teaching us that we will be saved through works. It's teaching us how that doesn't work for us. It's a path that no one successfully treads. But he does say this, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires... They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So there's a, this coming time where, where all men will stand and be judged, and the non-believer here, right, who... who it, it's just it's just any old person here, not a group of Christians. He's talking about normal people here that are just kind of like categorized as humans here, non-Jewish humans. And they have two things I want to highlight. Um, sometimes they do, while they don't have the law, right, they still do what the law requires. So maybe there's times where the man turns his eyes away so he will not lust after his neighbor's wife. Or there's times where he returns what his neighbor's goods he found and, and doesn't steal them. There's times where they do good things and those are the things required of the law, such that, and you might be like, well, those weren't really good works that they did. But but actually here it says that on the day when they're judged by by God, um, ultimately judged by Jesus Christ, which is super interesting that Jesus is the ultimate judge, final arbiter of, of, of man's judgment. But when this happens, they have their conscience accusing or even excusing them. That is, all of the individual things they've done in their life all will be judged. Jesus says every every casual word spoken will be judged. And there's times where 
the thing that they did, they will not be punished for. They won't be judged negatively for. But there's other things they did they will be, they'll be judged negatively for. So it seems like there's, I mean, I'm trying to build a biblical case for what seems also like very much common sense. People do good things, and they're not all Christians. Okay, but I said I was going to like qualify that statement a little bit and give you like a caveat, and that is that though they do good things, the Bible, just like we do, we often use the term good in two very different senses. One is good in the sense of like, hey, that was a good thing. I'm glad you did that. That was a positive thing. That was a proper thing that you did. And we also can use good in that ultimate sense, like when it refers to God. Jesus did this with the, the, the rich young ruler when he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. That was good in the ultimate sense. But then the Bible also calls Joseph of Arimathea a good man. Well, they're not saying he's God. It, it, the Bible's using the same word in two very different contexts. We should too. People can do good works, but are those good works like the goodness that God requires for our salvation, the ultimate goodness where we are held up to holiness? You know, it's the equivalent of, um, you know, someone grabs, says, oh, I cleaned the room and someone grabs that white glove and they start running their finger along all the surfaces. When they grab that white glove, you know they're 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 measuring by a new level of 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 cleanness. You didn't mean it when you were when you were like it's clean. You didn't mean like white glove clean, right? When I say that person's good, that action was good. I don't mean God's holiness level of good. I often just mean it's in, on that positive side of things. Um, normal people talk this way. The Bible talks this way, but it's important to recognize that while an, an unbeliever might do a good thing, that doesn't mean that they're doing something that is like deserving of salvation or something like that. So there's a flaw even in the good works that an unbeliever does, not because his works are so different. Like if I run into a burning building to rescue somebody and I'm not a Christian versus I run into a burning building to rescue somebody and I am a Christian, we're both basically doing the same thing, but we have a different posture towards God when we do it. All the good that I do apart from Christ I do it apart from Christ. Thanks. I'm just going to sit here until I see it kick back on. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. It's, it says excellent condition now, but it's, oh, I don't know what's going on, guys. I'm sorry that this is the internet um, provider I've got. I don't, I don't live in an affluent area. There isn't, and there isn't great infrastructure for internet. I have the best internet I can get. And they don't always reliably give you the internet that they say you're going to get in blah, blah, blah. Anyways, sorry for the interruption. I'll just continue and hope that you guys heard me. Um, the Bible points out this difference between an unbeliever's good thing that they did and a believer's good thing they did, which with in Hebrews, the phrase apart from faith, it is impossible to please him. So that is to say, if you don't have faith in God, then whatever actions you take, however good they are, they're being done outside of the, ele the element of faith in, in God. They're not done toward the Lord. They're not done for God. And God, Jesus says that the number one ultimate command we should obey at all times is to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the number one. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, but if I reject the first, even when I'm obeying the second, loving my neighbor in some way, there's some flaw even in the neighborly love because itself it is done in rebellion to God in some fashion. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I will go on to question number two, and this one, bring it up, comes in from Mike Grigas, who says, the hiddenness and silence of God is causing me doubts. Is there any advice or help you can offer, such as that God is silent now because revelation has been completed with the New Testament? Thanks. So Mike, the hiddenness of God is, is one of the... Um, it's simultaneously a philosophical argument against God's existence, or at least against God's love. And on the other hand, it is also um, a very emotionally heavy and influential argument. Often the more philosophical arguments aren't emotionally very impactful, I think, a lot of times. You know, like I look at, say, the um, the Kalam cosmological argument, I go, oh, that's a really good argument for God's existence, but I don't know how much it strikes people's emotions. I look at the moral argument and I go, ah, that one hits people's emotions and it's intellectually strong as well. So that, that's interesting. This kind of hits both. 
And the hiddenness argument goes something like this. And I'm just going to, I mean, something like this. I don't have a, a syllogism before me to, to present to you, but it goes something like this. Hey, um, if God really loves people and he wants them to know him and he wants them to follow him, then he would make efforts to reveal himself to those people, right? So if you had a sincere non-believer, a, a, a non-believer who was sincerely looking and searching for God but not finding God, that would perhaps prove that God doesn't really love them and want them saved. Because look, they're sincere and they're trying but they're not finding. So there must be some fault in God because their motives, intentions, and methods are right. This is the divine hiddenness thing. God's So God's hiding from this person, this, this hypothetical person. Um, there's a few ways to poke holes in this argument, okay? <clears throat> Logically speaking, I think. One is to challenge how much sincerity is really going on in this person. How much they now... Uh, I do not mean that they are knowingly insincere, right? Uh, let, me, let me give you an example that all of us can understand. When you are a teenager, there is probably somebody who you loved. You sincerely believed that you loved, I'm using air quotes for anybody listening on the podcast, <laughs> you sincerely loved this person, you really believed you really loved this person, but... You found out over the course of time that what you had was something other than a sincere and genuine and selfless love and was more like an infatuation with an idea, not even a whole real person. And you you ended up later looking back at your love of that person and kind of laughing at it. What's weird about humans is that we know we were foolish as teenagers, but we think we are very wise as adults and we sometimes overestimate the goodness and All right, <clears throat> it appears to be back. <laughs> so this is me just waiting for the delay to show me that it's back on. Okay, so the divine hiddenness idea is that, yeah, this person's really genuinely that sincere. Um, what I want to suggest for you, Mike, is to consider the possibility that while they believe they're sincere, I'm not saying they're knowingly being deceitful about how sincere they are in their searching of God, there can be lots of things going on in the heart of a human where they feel they are sincerely looking. I've, I've seen atheists who bring a divine hiddenness argument, um, and the way they do it, it's as though the argument was an afterthought to their atheism. And they say to me how sincere they, I'm not saying every atheist is like this, I'm merely giving one example of one way this can play out. Um, they, they, they say like, hey, I'm gonna spend a little time like really praying, really going to church even, really maybe singing worship songs, as a way of later being able to say, hey, I sought the Lord, I really tried, and that confirms my atheism one more time. Perhaps the agenda here was a way of proving themselves right about God all along. This is entirely possible. This is how human psychology seems to work. Um, what I'm suggesting is divine hiddenness requires a certain kind of person that may not exist. Against this is quite a number of people who suggest and, and they give their testimony that they did seek the Lord and they did find him. They did cry out to God and he did answer. They did open the word of God. They did start praying. They did start attending church or something like this. And they started seeking the Lord. And then their lives were radically transformed. And every one of those testimonies would seem to be an argument against this divine hiddenness thing. The problem with the divine hiddenness argument, though, is not the, is not the logical aspect of it. Because I can easily say, hey... Humans have all sorts of layers of desires and, and, and wants. We may be sincere in one level, but insincere in another. We might be in bondage to sin. Our blindness right now in seeking God might be due to past sins we've committed that have brought us to that blindness. So we might be actually reaping the blindness of our own decisions and we're blaming God for that inability to see him. Like I can say all those things, but what really makes this one hard, Mike, is that what I'm doing is I'm talking about like your buddy Joe. I mean, in your head, like I'm talking about your friend Joe, who told you, oh, "I want to see God after I I want to know," and and use this not just as, "Hey, pray for me, I want to see God," but use this as an argument against God's existence. I mean, it, you can almost here's a, here's a here's a way to test maybe for an atheist. If you're sincerely seeking God and you really want to find Him. Why are you using your so far lack of finding him as a way of arguing for others to not believe in him? 
right? Like this shows there's something going on here other than just a sincere seeking. So my, um, my thought is the hard part is that people then make it personal. Mike's not talking about this logical argument about God and his existence or, or, or whatever. Mike's talking about me. He's attacking me personally. He's By making the argument depend upon my, if I'm the atheist, depend, depend upon my sincerity and my integrity, I then come into a, currently in our culture, a very advantageous position for arguing where I get to say, anyone who disagrees with me on this hiddenness thing is attacking me personally. They're attacking my sincerity. They're attacking my integrity. They're attacking my story. They're attacking my life, my lived experience. And that alone is incredibly persuasive for people, especially in our current culture. Um, and for that, I go, okay, well, let's just acknowledge what's going on here. You're turning the existence of God into a, a either I either I agree with you that you have good reason to think God doesn't exist, or you see you see me as personally attacking you because you've based your argument upon your own integrity and your own sincerity and the thoroughness and purity of your own search for God. And the bottom line, though, is I don't think, Mike, that this should stumble you in your walk with God. Have you sought the Lord and found him? Why would you stop believing him because someone else says that they seek the Lord and don't find him? I, I, would, I would question the accuracy of those claims. They would say I'm personally attacking them. At least they potentially would. And I'd be okay with that. I'd be, I'd be like, well, you brought it up. Like, you're the one that laid out your sincerity as the rule by which you will test God's existence. I'm saying I don't think that's a trustworthy uh, rule. Number three, um, Underground River says, I'm a young pastor of a church with people mostly in their 60s and 70s. My staff only micro, often micromanages me, corrects me in public, and treats me like a grandchild instead of their pastor. Any advice? Well, knowing very little about your situation, I'll give you just what brotherly advice comes to my mind here. And um, one of them is... I'll give you three pieces of advice. One is to genuinely see this as an opportunity to grow thicker skin. I'm not saying that you aren't being offended or they're not mistreating you. I'm not saying that at all. But you know this from reading scripture, that our trials are meant to refine us and that our hardships and difficulties are meant to change our character and that the things that tax our patience are meant to teach us patience. And so you as a pastor, you're, you're getting a chance to display grace and patience in front of all of the people that are there even when when you see them as the ones that are mistreating you. I mean, Jesus most optimally demonstrated his love by the way he treated those who mistreated him. And so this is something where I would say, see this, is, it doesn't make them right in what they're doing, but it does remind you that this is there's a spiritual battle going on here in your character to serve the Lord and honor him in those things. The second thing I would say is... Um, Maybe I'll say five things, four things. I don't know. I'm already forgetting the numbers I had in my head. <laughs> but the second thing I'll say is um, don't bow to being micromanaged if the decision you're making is honestly within your purview, within your authority, and you fully believe this is the right decision to make. Don't bow to that being micromanaged because what you're doing then is you're not just yielding in a positive and gracious sense of yielding. You're, you're, um, you're, you're abandoning your responsibility to make the right decisions in some areas. And so listen to the people, but when, you know, when that, when that kind of pressure comes and if you get kind of pushed down into a always give in mentality, that can actually be very unhealthy. So what I'm saying is first point, be gracious to those who are doing this to you, treat them with love and kindness. But second point, don't just be a pushover, be willing to yield and listen. If there's any wisdom in what they say, receive it, take time to think about it. But, when you have the right decision here and someone else pushes against, don't just give in and give up all the time. And um, just to, to do that graciously, though, is is the trick. The next thing I'll say is that scripture does say, because you said you're a young pastor and you have a church with people mostly in their 60s and 70s. And I would say this is the one thing I would want to remind you, have, have you remind yourself of a lot. And that is that scripture says um, to, like it gives the example, rise in the presence of, of an old man. That, that this 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 idea of respecting those who are older than us, who have a lot more wisdom and experience than us, is huge, absolutely huge. And there's times where they are going to not know and they're going to be wrong. But there's probably a lot of times where you can learn so much from these people. And if you see it as a as a this is where you got to guard your heart. If you see it as a competition relationship where you're competing for like spiritual superiority. 
because I've seen that. And if, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I mean. Where we're not just brothers and sisters getting along. We're sort of like competing for who, who is the, the top dog spiritually. If that happens, it'll kill, it'll kill lots of things. It'll, it'll be a long list of things that die because of that. But if you can listen to them and say, hey, 60s and 70s, like here, maybe you're 30. And you're like, this, per the, this person has literally 30 more adult, adult years in their life than I do. Right? Like, I've, how long have I really been an adult and acting like it? They've got 30 plus years of that, more than me. Maybe there's wisdom in what they're saying, even if they're not 100% right. Give them the respect. Give them the hearing. Don't abandon your role to make a decision, but know that you are there with people who are your elders, biologically speaking, and they may have wisdom for you and you can learn and grow from it. And finally, the last thing I would say is this. If you feel like it's really a problem, one-on-one... -on -one, take someone out to coffee and say, hey, I've been struggling with this problem. I, I know I'm younger, but I am the person who's been called and put into this position of pastor and I got to make a lot of decisions. I sometimes feel like everybody else has an idea of how they think things should be run. And a lot of people are kind of trying to push me into their decisions instead of just giving me input to make my own decisions. I want to hear them. I want to hear you, but I want to be able to make a decision and not feel like I have to just bow to the decisions of everybody else. You know, you're not the pastor. You, you, you guys brought me in. And so I want to try to serve the Lord, hear you. But you see, this one-on-one -on -one confrontation is the most gracious way to do it, I think, where you explain your honest dilemma. Like, I want to hear you, but, but you can't just control me. You can't just pull me on puppet strings. If you can do that with the top offenders, <laughs> pull them aside, gracious brotherly conversation with them, then I would, I would suspect in most cases things would get better. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. Consider it with wisdom. I pray the Lord guides you in how to handle this. Uh, Adiana Never Listens. That's the name of the YouTube channel. And um, I'm like, I hope you're Adiana and you're joking about yourself and you didn't make a whole channel to say that somebody else doesn't ever listen. Adiana Never Listens says, is Christian nationalism in the sense of theocracy a scriptural concept? I think the answer to that is no. Um, I am, so I'm trying to think of how much I'll share with you guys on this. Um, I am rather firmly convinced that theocracy or trying to push, and it, let's take the term Christian nationalism because I don't even know what people mean by that term a lot of the time. So I, it's hard to say yes or no because I literally don't know what they mean most of the time when people say it. Um, people use it in different ways. But theocracy, that makes a little more sense, right? Now we're talking like the state is 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 pushing, um, oh, you know, obedience to their understanding of God, their understanding of religion, that sort of thing. Um, Christian Christianity does not want a theocracy. Uh, we're not raised to be that way. A few points would be this: um, in the Old Testament, God does not call for theocracies for generally for governments around the world. Doesn't call for them. He made one theocracy, that was Israel. But in that, Isra in Israel didn't just become a, th this is super important, they didn't become a theocracy because they decided to write laws that would be theocracy laws. They became a theocracy because God rescued them out of Egypt, planted them in the land, set up leaders, anointed prophets and judges, gave them the laws himself. Like he, God set up the theocracy. Unless God gives you the theocracy, like you can't, anything you set up that you call theocracy is just man claiming the power of God. That's one reason why we don't want that. Um, in the New Testament, we don't have anything like that going on. right? We don't have the institution of a new theocratic political government like ancient Israel. No, what we have here is the body of Christ, which is this organ, organic thing that grows and populates all countries of the world. Jesus says, go into all the nations, not go and spread the nation of Christianity, right? It's not, we're not converting them into a new nationality. We're bringing them into Christ. Jesus said, um, my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my servants would fight. That's a statement about the nature of his kingdom. The kingdom he was setting up on earth was not of this world. When Jesus comes back, second coming, boom, he takes over. That's the next theocracy. As a Christian, I want a theocracy, but I want it when Jesus personally comes to earth, sets it up himself. That's the only theocracy I'm looking for. Other than that, I'm looking to obey Jesus as Lord and submit secondarily to government and not look to government to enforce like 
obedience to Christ or or that sort of thing. Um, now, I did do an, a discussion with a guy who believes in something called theonomy, which is connected to this, uh, recently, and I'll probably be putting it up on my YouTube channel. I disagree with theonomy. I disagree with it actually more after having had the discussion than I did before, but most of the discussion is actually him building his case and me just kind of listening because that's I'll, I'll explain when I put the video up. You're not going to get all my thoughts on it. You're going to get mostly his thoughts on it and a few little snippets from me. But I uh, feel fairly convinced, fairly strongly convinced right now that theonomy or a theocracy, and if that's what you mean by Christian nationalism, is unbiblical, not ideal, and is uh, going, if you try to go that route, you're going to bring a large number of bad and unpleasant things. All right, let's do the next one. Francis Guzman says, how is God's judgment? He's judge carrying out consequences and his justice, establishing order, different if he uses his judgment to apply justice. Or can you explain his judgment slash justice? Francis, I'm gonna have to read this question again. Um, Francis is suffering from the the YouTube comment limit <laughs> where he's not able to say, you know, write a whole paragraph, like three three paragraphs explaining his question. He's trying to cram it all in there, which I totally understand. Let me read it again and try to understand what you're saying. How is God's judgment, and I'll, I'll leave out the parenthetical parts, how is God's judgment and his justice different if he uses his judgment to apply justice? Or can you explain his judgment slash justice? Um... I mean, all I can think, Francis, off the top of my head here is that the the, the idea of judgment and the, the concepts judgment and the concept of justice are two very different kinds of concepts, though they're related. Judgment has to do with decisions that are being made. God makes decisions, his judgment on this issue, on that issue. And it could be uh, for punishment or it could even be for reward. But these are all judgment-related things. They're always decisions. God's There's a situation there's a scenario, there's an event, there's a person, and there's a decision that is made about that thing, and that is God's judgment. Now, the judgment plays out sometimes in God, say, like, raining fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so, like, the judgment, that's what we'll call God's judgment, but that's like his judgment, the result of the decision he made about those things. God's justice is different, because God's justice is more like it goes beyond decisions God makes relating to humanity and the events of the world and angels and stuff. And God's justice is like an inherent part of his character. God is just. Like he is right. It's his rightness, his perfect behavior in all scenarios that's connected to God's justice. Um, when God's justice meets the scenarios of humankind, then we often see God's judgment. So God's justice, this innate like quality of his character, God is just, comes out into the world with proper judgments and actions towards the things in the world. That's how I would conceive of it, at least at this moment on, on Friday. <laughs> Let's look at the next one. Maniac has a question. I'm attending a bachelor party, and I have a Christian coworker who said Christians shouldn't go to bachelor parties. How would you respond to this? all at the party profess to be Christians. Um, yeah, Maniac, uh, you know, when someone says Christians shouldn't go to bachelor parties, I think if you're in the moment, you could just ask them, why not? And let them explain their reasoning. Now, maybe they'll say, um, bachelor parties are worldly. Well, you can ask them another question. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by worldly? What do you think a bachelor party is? That's another good question to ask somebody. What do you think a bachelor party is? So, if a bachelor party, if you're getting the idea of a bachelor party from movies, movies do not represent reality. Although reality will, especially worldly reality, right? We're, we're, let me say a few things real quick that you might not agree with, and that's okay. I think that in the United States in particular, we're, we're a people without, without culture. Um, we've lost a lot of culture. Um, this is just my personal opinion here, is that I'm, I'm Irish, right? Like, that's why I wear a green shirt. No, that's, no, that's not really what it means to be Irish. Uh, I wear sure this has pitfall on it because that was a game I played when I was a kid. Um, but I'm Irish. If you went back to Ireland hundreds of years, 
there would probably be cultural symbols and behaviors they do all around a wedding. You know, the week before the wedding, the day of the wedding, after the wedding, all these things that they would probably do that would be part of the culture. When we come to America, people from various cultures show up and then they slowly lose their culture. Like, I know I'm Irish, but there's nothing about me that's very Irish, right? There's really not much of anything about me that's Irish in my behaviors. So I've kind of lost that culture. And so now this creates a vacuum in America where we just don't really have a whole lot of culture in a lot of ways. Totally my personal opinion. You guys can disagree with me. And then we have movies and TV, which are a very American thing. And they constantly parade the most obnoxious, ungodly, wicked practices as if they are normal. This hits my gap where I lack culture, where I lack rituals that are not ungodly. They're just rituals of marriage, rituals of this and that. And I borrow from the movies, the most ungodly, the most wicked, the most repetitiously perverse things. And I turn that into my culture. Okay. I could be completely wrong on all of that. So this is what I want to say now about bachelor parties. It's just something I've been thinking about recently. And I wonder, I wonder what you guys think about it. Tell me in the comments, maybe, um, do you think there's anything wrong with that reasoning? I bet it would only be a generalization. Obviously there's a lot more layers to it. Um, a bachelor party that involves wicked things like, dr like getting drunk. Okay. Drinking itself is not a sin, but getting drunk, um, a stripper. Like I've never known anybody in my personal life who, who brought a stripper to a bachelor party, not to my knowledge. Okay. Even the, un the I've known unbelievers who probably wouldn't tell me if they did. Okay. Right. So maybe not, maybe they have, and I just didn't know, but I'm just saying, don't pretend this is normal just because you saw it on TV. Some people make it normal because they watch it on TV. Um, so yeah, if you go to a Christian bachelor party, what are you doing? You're celebrating the man getting married. So we tried, you know, for bachelor parties that I've been part of as a Christian man, which I think was totally fine. We did things like all the, all the guys gathered around and they gave him some marriage advice. Like we just sat around, especially the married guys, right? They, they just gave encouragement. Hey man, here's what God calls you to as a husband and prayed over him and then played like video games or went out into the batting cages or went shooting or something like that and did something that they thought just was fun. Nothing sinful, nothing ungodly about it. So yeah, nothing's wrong inherently with a bachelor party if it's just celebration of the marriage. But if instead the bachelor party is, let me sin in a bunch of ways I think I'm not supposed to after I'm married, then you, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so it depends on uh, what you what you mean exactly. Let's go to number seven. Um, Aska Zeichnet says, I think I might've pronounced that right. Maybe either way, I'm not looking back. What are your thoughts on Christians that have rapture dreams claiming it's soon? Do you think these are from God or just a result of all the end times talk that has ramped up lately? Um, my, my personal opinion, um, I pay zero attention to it. I've, I, I believe in the coming of Christ 100%. I'm excited about it. But I am personally, um, I have, okay, so I've been a Christian now for many years. I've been in ministry since I was like 18, 19. And I've heard so many rapture predictions that I just don't care anymore. I mean, scripture tells me no one knows the day or the hour, but people are continually trying to say, well, I know kind of like maybe the month, <laughs> you know, maybe they didn't know them, but maybe I know it now, maybe. I am completely uninterested in somebody who tells me they know the day or the hour. Here's the question I usually have for them and I'll give it to you for, to, to tell them as well. Those who tell me, I know when Jesus is coming back and they give me a date, I, I usually ask them something like, if you are wrong, if that date comes and passes and Jesus has not returned, how will you respond? And this is the important part, because you have publicly proclaimed when Jesus will return. See, it's one thing to think privately, oh, I feel like it's coming soon. It's something else to go and tell other people that they should believe based on your testimony that it's coming at such and such time. If you're wrong, you should have a public, open, ashamed repentance where you tell everybody how you were unreliable, you misunderstood, you mistook 
your dream for the voice of God. You mistook your guess for the clear teaching of Scripture. There should be a public, embarrassing explanation of why you feel terrible. Instead, they do it again in a year. And that's why, for me, people who predict the rapture usually go on a list in my head of people I don't trust when it comes to their spiritual predictions and interpretations and all that sort of thing. I'm just being completely honest with you. Um, it has happened so much. If the person learns from it, that's totally fine. They learned from it. They grew. They never did it again. I'm like, I respect that. I appreciate that. Thank you. But if they continue, then they get on the list <laughs> in my head. Uh, doesn't mean I don't love them. Doesn't mean they're not my brother and sister. But it means that when they tell me, like, this thing's going to happen. That's I just, I just, okay. I move on. Yeah. It's going to ramp up more. I, I predict, not prophesy, I predict based upon my understanding of human nature that we will see a large increase in rapture predictions, in second coming predictions, in tribulation predictions, all three of those, depending on what your views are in eschatology. We will see a huge increase over the next um, 15 years, especially, uh, and it'll, it'll hit crazy when you get near like 2030, 2031, 2032, 2033, and then you're going to have 20. It, it's just going to be in that session because we're exactly 2,000 years out. G, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was walking the earth right now, right? Hadn't started his ministry yet. He's walking the earth right now. When you get to the moment of like the baptism of Jesus, approximately 2,000 years, you know, the, 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 um, the death of Christ, the resurrection, when you get to the ascension, um, Pentecost, when you have the, at least what people think is exactly 2,000 years from Pentecost or from those events, you're going to have a lot of people predicting these things big time, and I'm fully ready to ignore them. All right, let's go to the next one. Not because I doubt scripture. Oh, I do not. Billa has a question. Thank you for allowing God to use you in this ministry. Oh, thank you, Billa, for that encouragement. In Numbers, why did God punish Aaron for unbelief when Moses is the one who struck the rock? Huh. I don't even remember. Um, let's look at this passage and see what you what what you're uh, what you're talking about here. Uh, then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, "Here now, you rebels! Shall we bring water for you out of this rock?" And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said. To Moses and Aaron, and that's probably what you noticed. I didn't remember that. Uh, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as <clears throat> holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. So yeah, it ends up being something both of them. I guess, I, you know, I always focused on Moses in this regard. That it was Moses was the one who, I mean, he was told he couldn't enter the land. But yeah, Aaron was too. I guess I didn't think Aaron had a lot of hope already because of the whole like golden calf incident. But um, but yeah, how interesting. The Lord says it's in both of them. I think the answer looks like it's in verse 10. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly, and then Moses is the one who speaks to them, right? And he strikes the rock, but Aaron is joined in the plot or the plan to do this. It's, it, okay, let me offer, um, how could Aaron be joined? How could he be participating in this? Well, here's one possibility, could be wrong. Um, Moses and Aaron together are talking about how annoying all the people are being as they complain. Oh, you brought us out here to die. Oh, and there's no faith in them. And Moses and Aaron get angry and frustrated. And so they go to strike the, they, they say, um, uh, let's get the people together and show them like, you know, there's like a bad attitude about it. They're not honoring God as, as holy ultimately in this. And then of course, I mean, that, that would be one explanation of why perhaps Aaron was involved. Obviously God knows the heart of Aaron he knows the heart of Moses. The scripture does say that they they did this gathering of the people together, both of them. Now, it's not like there's people are, there are too many for just two people to gather them. So when you name Moses and Aaron as gathering them for this purpose, it seems to mean that they were behind the whole thing and not just um, Aaron wasn't just the Aaron to boy for Moses in it. Uh, now, a lot of people would say, like, why was Moses upset or got upset with Moses and Aaron in the first place for striking a rock? I, th I think that 
the Jesus connection to this verse is amazing. And I'll mention it for anybody who doesn't already know it. There's more you can dig into this, but briefly. This rock thing, was it, was, it happened twice. The rock was struck by Moses once, and, and God told him to strike it, and water came out. And this was um, an act of, <clears throat> or excuse me, he spoke to, to, the, to the rock, and, and water came out. Then, uh, then when, he, when it happens again, he strikes the rock, and he strikes it twice. And water came out. And the Jesus connection, in short, which I can't remember all the details, is that Jesus is like the rock. He struck it the first time. Yeah, that's right. Um, who's struck it, who struck once, and that's right, he should have spoke to it the second time. This is how I would have probably explained it had I thought about it more. <laughs> and, um, and that this connection with the striking of the rock is to say that Christ, once stricken for our sins, does not need to be stricken again. He, he can just be called upon and, and he'll, you know, give us that living water. Now, the New Testament actually calls Jesus the rock that was struck. So this is not my invention here. This is the New Testament makes this connection to Jesus. He's given this image, this, this typography of being the rock that was struck. And I think that's really interesting. Now, now, if that's right, if this rock was meant to symbolize and represent Christ himself, then how important was it that Moses didn't mess that symbol up? the way that him and Aaron did. All right, let's go to the next question. Numero nueve. Shelly Scholes says, I struggle with addiction to nicotine and caffeine. There are no rehab centers for these. What do I do? I know it's sin, but I need help to overcome. I can't be a slave to two masters. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, uh, Shelly, I don't know your whole situation and your whole life and everything like that. And the first thing I think any counselor would do if they're going to talk to you about this is, assess your situation by asking you a bunch of questions. That's my first advice to you is um, sit down with somebody who you can you can share all these details. How much of this is a serious problem? How much of this is um, maybe you're overreacting in some ways to some of these things? Um, is it, but maybe it is a real, maybe like you say, addiction to like say caffeine, like maybe that's like a really serious problem for you. But I would also encourage you then to get educated about how these things work. Um, caffeine under there's so much information now online that it's very helpful caffeine nicotine all of these things you can learn how they function in your body so that you can have a more efficient and successful method for overcoming those things because they have a chemical effect on your body and then when you stop using them that has a chemical effect and there's different things you can do that i'm not all aware of that like layer down the impact of the effect on your body to make that process more simple and easier um, anyway, <clears throat> other than that, I, I want to say, Shelly, that no matter what you do, no matter how much help you get, whether that might, maybe that is, um, you, you'd start doing half calf coffee, half caffeinated or a third caffeinated or three quarters. And then you, you bring it down until you're just drinking like decaf coffee and you've, you've tapered it down. Or maybe you go from, you know, cigarettes that you're smoking perhaps to like a nicotine patch and then you go down from that to less and less or maybe you just do cold turkey. Whatever scenario you pick, whatever path you do for overcoming this thing in your life that you see as like a serious issue, I want to suggest that no, nobody can take away your free will in this situation. And that's probably the most frustrating aspect is that we, me included, I inherently want to look elsewhere for the for the willpower to, to do the right thing. As a Christian, God has given me his Holy Spirit and he calls me to walk in the Spirit and that is a decision I make. And so I continually, I mean, you'll find it in your prayers, Lord, help me to not do this thing that I'm doing. There's, for me, as I've prayed that so many times because I'm a human just like you, I feel like sometimes when I've prayed that it's been it's been me abandoning responsibility for my own decisions to some degree. Not that it's always wrong to pray that, but I'm just talking about like the general vibe in my heart that says to God, I give up on me making right choices. Will you just make them for me? I think it has to come right back circle to I'm already helping you to make right choices. You need to make them. And so no matter how much help you get, no matter what assistance you have or what plan you have and you educate yourself on those things, which is a good idea, there's going to be a willpower moment where you say, I will walk in the spirit. 
I will mortify the flesh and I will do the right thing. It's just a decision I make. The only other advice I could give to you is this. Um, cutting off sin is easiest when you cut it off early and small instead of cutting it off late when it's big. It's like, it's like a fire. Start a little fire, it's easy to put out. Start it, wait five minutes, 10 minutes. Now it's really hard to put it out. So when I'm first tempted with any sin, if I immediately start to deal with it, find something else to do instead of that thing, immediately. Don't just sit and ponder on it, don't feed it, don't create provision for it. Like why do I have packs of cigarettes all over the house if this is something I'm really trying to quit? Um, don't make provision for it. Don't take that first step. Find the first step towards your sin and stop that step. It's much easier than stopping something way later down the road. Those are hopefully helpful things for you, Shelly. God bless you. Reed has a question. Did the synoptic writers translate Jesus's words from Aramaic to Greek? Does that partially explain why they don't match each other exactly? Because they translated to best explain his teaching. Um, let me answer the second question first. Um, the, in the New Testament time, the quotation mark, perfect, direct, word-for-word -word quote was not, a, was not like a practice. It just, it's not like they never did it. It's not like you never, ever wrote down word-for-word -word what somebody said, but the idea that you had to always word for word, you know, quote somebody was not this super big deal. We do it all the time nowadays. It's part of our culture. It's our writing culture in particular. We often want word for word quotes, exact words. Um, that was not the case back then. The quotation marks themselves literally didn't exist. Okay. So like they don't even have a convention for doing that at the time. So that could easily explain differences in the way things are worded in the Gospels. There was an understandable liberty that, hey, I really heard Jesus. I understood the context of what he was saying, whether they communicate it perfectly. Uh, I should say they can, can communicate it perfectly, but without always using the exact same words because they understand what he was really saying. Um, another explanation of different wording for say you have in the Gospel, Jesus says this phrase here, and he says it slightly different in like Matthew and Luke or something. Another explanation for that is that Jesus taught for three years and he taught on a circuit. Now circuit teachers, traveling teachers, or what they call itinerant teachers, they teach the same material over and over again in different audiences. Now even an itinerant teacher is going, who teaches the exact same thing over and over again, they will change their wording all the time. That's normal, that's custom, that's standard. So when we have in the four Gospels, Jesus making statements and there's the similar wording, but slightly different, it could be because Jesus sometimes said it that way. Sometimes he didn't. That's maybe, maybe he said it eight different ways and we have two of them represented in the Gospels. So I think that'd be fine as well. Now, let me come back to what I find to be a super interesting question. Did they translate Jesus's words from Aramaic, the popular language of the time for the Jews, to Greek? I think the answer is no. I mean, there's probably occasions where Jesus was speaking in, in Aramaic and they translated that for us into Greek, so that I shouldn't say entirely no. But a lot of what Jesus taught, it seems like he may have taught it in Greek. And there's a scholar I can point you to who's done work on this, and his name is Dr. Peter Williams. And he works with Tyndale House. He's like the, the president, I think, of Tyndale House. And I've been really grateful for his work on this because I, for a long time, was like, why do we think Jesus couldn't speak Greek? Like, why is it? It's just assumed by scholars all over the place. Like, it's just assumed. And this is what Peter Williams, with his much greater knowledge, has really pointed out. He's like, scholars have just presumed Jesus didn't speak Greek. There is no reason to think he didn't. We have lots of reason to think he did. Jesus was there in Galilee where there's Greek and Jewish interaction going on all the time. Right, the, the fishermen on Galilee, there's Greek ones, Greek speaking ones, and then Aramaic or, or Hebrew, however you can argue on that. They're both there. Jesus was a carpenter. They're getting hired for work that they do potentially for Greek speakers. We've even found ancient, an ancient sign in Nazareth that was written in what language? Greek. Like why would the Romans put up a Greek sign in a town where nobody can speak Greek? But Peter Williams also has also pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount, when you look at it in Greek, like if you try to take it back to Aramaic, it doesn't it doesn't work the same way. But if you look at it in Greek, 
which was very much the common language of the day. It was the most used for that region. It has a rhyming structure in it, the Sermon on the Mount, implying that it's in this was in Greek. You know, when you get to Jesus' statement, his conversation with Nicodemus, that's happening, it seems, actually in Greek in John chapter 3. He talks to Nicodemus, and it seems like the conversation really happened in Greek. Jesus' whole play on the words of born and born again and stuff, it doesn't work in Aramaic. It works in Greek. And it would make sense that Nicodemus, who speaks Greek but also speaks Hebrew or Aramaic, he doesn't want to use that language in case one of the real diehards is walking around and they overhear. So I, I don't think we have any reason to think Jesus didn't speak Greek. I think we have several good reasons to think he probably did. And Peter probably did and probably got better at it over time as they continued to preach the gospel. So yeah, check out Peter Williams. Um, if I had a specific paper in mind, I would share it with you. I think that he has a video on it somewhere though. Number 11, Bethy Cammy says, Hi, Pastor Mike. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Hi, Bethy, by the way. Um, says we should forgive others of their trespasses or our Father will not forgive us of ours. But the Bible says that all our sins on the, uh, the Bible, but the Bible also say that all our sins on the cross. Can you explain? So like our sins are on the cross, like I'm, all my sins are forgiven. But then I have this kind of threatening statement here in Matthew 6. Let's look at it. Jesus, he, he, we, I was just talking about this, 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 this whole passage, the Sermon on the Mount, right? Um, the, uh, the earlier section where he gives the Beatitudes, that's where you, you find the rhyming structure. The, the, the pithy remarks seem like they were written in Greek originally, spoken in Greek originally, I should say. Um, not written. Uh, all right, Matthew 6, 14. Jesus, after he gives the Lord's Prayer, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this is kind of made even stronger when you think about the parable where Jesus talks about the unforgiving servant who was forgiven much, and then he went and attacked this other guy who owed him money, and then he was unforgiven. He was reverse forgiven, right? Like the forgiveness that he'd been given was taken away, and he was cast into um, the debtor's prison and stuff. He has to pay it all off. So, how does this work? Are, is now I don't I don't have a firm stance yet. I, I hopefully will once I go through the Book of Hebrews. I'm going to do a whole study on it to settle my own heart and mind on the issue on whether or not a person can lose their salvation. But I'll offer you two different interpretations, okay? This is how the two sides, I think, would interpret it. One side saying, this is just proof you can lose your salvation. And the other side saying, no, it's not, and here's why. So <clears throat> those who say it's proof you can lose your salvation, well, that's obvious. They're like, hey, yeah. So if you're a Christian, but you won't forgive anybody, then you lose your salvation. If God doesn't forgive you. Um, then the other side is going to turn and look at it. And they're going to say, no, this is just evidence that they were never forgiven in the first place. They didn't truly have a relationship with God in the first place. Like Jesus says to those he casts out, he says, I never knew you. You were never one of mine. John says, you know, you know, they departed from us because they weren't really of us. They weren't really part of us to start with. So it says here, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. This could be seen as fruit of salvation on the, on the side who says once saved, always saved. And, and I think this is, this. I, I wouldn't argue with them that they're wrong on this. My point will come after I explain this. They go, look, if you're really saved, you're going to bear the fruit of that. You're going to be forgiving because he who loves, has been loved much, loves much, you know? And he, he who's been forgiven is forgiving. So like, yeah, like this is, this is a symptom of salvation. You forgive others. It's not <clears throat> the cause. And I would agree it's a, it's a symptom, not the cause. Um, so uh, which side is right? Well, here's my current thinking on this, and I'll hopefully expand better on it when I get to Hebrews. I'll do a whole little research project on the topic at some point in the book of Hebrews of once saved, always saved, and share my best understanding of it. Um, more, more so, not just my understanding, I'll share all the debates on it so you guys can think it through. Um, but my thought here is that you you bring your theology of once saved, always saved, or... You can lose your salvation, whichever side you're on. You bring it with you into this passage. The passage doesn't clearly give it to you. And that's why a passage like this I find to be difficult 
to prove something here. He may just be talking about the behaviors of those who are forgiven. One of the ways you can see if someone's really a Christian, are they forgiving to, to others? And if they don't forgive them, well, maybe they're not really forgiven. Maybe this is a, a symptom that there hasn't been a true re reception of the grace of the gospel. Maybe. <clears throat> Number 12, Andrew Flair says, is typology only about Jesus? If so, how do we explain the type or anti-type in 1 Peter 3.21? If not, how do we tell true slash false types when no new theology can run afoul of denominational disagreement? <clears throat> um, let's try and tackle this one here. Let's first just look at your example, and then we'll try to see how it works with your question here. 1 Peter 3.21 which I think is on baptism. Yeah. Uh, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, <clears throat> not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever made the rule that typology always has to be about Jesus. Um, I don't, I'm sure someone has that rule. I don't have that rule in my head. That typology always has to be about Jesus. It certainly seems like it, typology in the Old Testament is totally preoccupied with Jesus. That does seem to be the case. And for anybody who doesn't follow this yet, by typology, that phrase typology, what we mean is the Old Testament does these things that are like, like Easter eggs. Right? These like hidden things that represent Jesus that later on when the New Testament comes, you go, oh, look at the Easter eggs all through the Old Testament that represent Jesus. Moses hits the rock. It's like, Jesus, he was broken for my salvation. You know, the baptism is, is, is kind of like the flood. You know, they, they go through the judgment, but then they make it all the way out because they're safe in the boat. Right? By the way, the boat here would be Jesus. <laughs> and so, I, so I do think this, this type of is Jesus, the, the, the type and the anti-type. The type is the boat, right? They were saved through water, the boat going through the water. <clears throat> um, there's the people, the boat, and the water, if you read verses 20 and 21. And that is like me and you, we're the people. The boat is like Jesus. The water is like baptism. Jesus dies and rises again, kind of like the boat goes into the water and comes out. I ride the coattails of Jesus through death and into life. Because he was the one who could survive the flood, who could make it through death to life. Whereas I was the one, if, if, if it was without the boat, I would just drown. I would just suffer the judgment of my own sins and die. <clears throat> but he could pay the penalty and survive, um, resurrect. So I, I think that this is about, is about Jesus, your example. Um, so yeah, I do think typology is preoccupied with Jesus, that's for sure. Does that mean every type in the Old Testament has to be about Jesus specifically? I, don't, I wouldn't argue for that. I'm open to others. But man, my, my series, Jesus in the Old Testament, we go through dozens upon dozens upon dozens, and they're, and they're just about Jesus so often that that's definitely the preoccupation. <clears throat> okay, so here's your follow-up question. You said, if typology is not always about Jesus, right, then how do we tell what's a true or false type when no new theology can run afoul of de denominational disagreement? Um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure how you how you mean that, Andrew. And again, this is an issue where it's just there's a limit to how many letters you can put in the YouTube comment, but uh, on a live chat. But I do have a rule that no new theology should come from our typology. That is a rule I think is absolutely important. I think it's very valuable. Um, I think that what we do is we establish our theology first through scriptures that demonstrate the theology clearly, then you can look at typology and see how the Easter eggs have been laid in the Old Testament for those things. Jesus's death and resurrection and the direct teaching about his identity establishes those things. <clears throat> the typology of Christ is connected to that. I'm safe as a Christian when I stick to the clear teachings of scripture reinforced by typology about those things. That's a safe place to be. One of the rules I have about typology is that no new theology. So when you say the issue of denominational disagreements, like let's say on mode of baptism or something like that, I would never use, I just would never use typology to establish that my denomination is correct on this issue or that issue. I would use clear teachings of scripture. What I'm saying is on these secondary issues, the denominational disagreements, I don't think typology should be brought into it. 
I think clear teaching of scripture should be brought in and we shouldn't argue from typology to our practices. <clears throat> this is the flaw of uh, the Marian dogmas of the Catholic Church. When it comes to the Bible, they can't find the stuff about Mary in the Bible in any clear fashion. And <clears throat> I mean, yeah, she was blessed. And Mary's blessed, right? Mary is blessed among women, right? Here's a Protestant saying it, as we have been for many years. <laughs> um, but, uh, but to say that Mary, like, was born without original sin, to say that Mary... <clears throat> didn't uh, didn't in some cases they say she didn't die, but the dogma is that she was she was taken up into heaven. It was the 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 assumption of Mary. Like those types of things, um, no, that's nowhere in Scripture. It's not really even in the early church at the in the very beginning. So what they do is they go to typology to prove this theology. This to me is interesting <laughs> because once you've established. Jesus, who the Old Testament is obsessed about, not just in typology, but in direct prophecy in a hundred ways, right? Like, it's not like we just see Jesus in typology. That's just like the icing on the cake. But when you go to typology to prove Mariology, for example, what you're doing is you're skipping over the entire process of proving a doctrine is true, and now you're just looking for ways to find analogies for it. And the typology that they use tends to be very poorly constructed. It's self-contradictory. It only has like two elements of connection instead of like seven or even just consistent elements of connection. Anyway, <clears throat> I've probably gone on too long in that question. <laughs> I hope that somewhere in all of my ramblings, Andrew, you found something helpful. Julia Sinecope, excuse me, says, what is Christ's law and how is it different from the Ten Commandments which may which many argue is the moral law we are to keep this day. This has been kind of an issue since um, I did this, this that, that discussion with Joel uh, from Right Response Ministries on theonomy. And I'll, like I said, I'll probably put it up on my channel sometime soon. Um, the law of Christ is the law of obedience to Jesus. I mean, that, that would be the law of Christ. I, I'm going to obey Jesus. Like it's, it's my law is Christ. Does that make, it makes sense to just think of law as like, the law or the rule is Jesus. I obey him. So I'm, gonna, I'm talking about his character, his goodness, his commands, all of the above. Um, <clears throat> Jesus summarized his, his, his commands to us with love God, right? And love others. So this is the commandment. This is the ultimate commandment that we have is love. But he also told us other things like go and preach the gospel. That's part of the law of Christ. Now that's not part of the Old Testament, really. Not the Old Testament law. There's no like go and proclaim these things to everyone around the world um, that by faith they can be saved. Like that's not part of the Old Testament law, but it's definitely part of the commands of Christ. So Jesus' commands are not the same. Um, you also say, <clears throat> how is it different than the Ten Commandments, which many argue is the moral law we are to keep to this day? Um, I think the Ten Commandments, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. Um, there are things that have been morally true from the time in Adam and Eve, and that's before the Ten Commandments were given. Some people try to say that Adam and Eve had the Ten Commandments. There's no biblical warrant for saying that. None. None. Galatians suggests the opposite. Romans suggests the opposite. That before the law, Abraham was there. He was justified 400 years plus before the law. Right. Well, if the law is the Ten Commandments and Abraham had that, then how can Abraham have anything before the law? If Adam and Eve had that, like that's not consistent. Um, so Adam and Eve knew moral truth and laws, didn't they? So God's moral law can't just be the Ten Commandments like they're identical with each other. But God's Ten Commandments to Israel definitely derives from and overlaps with moral laws. Like, don't murder? Yeah. Don't have other gods before me? Yeah, that's just a moral truth for all people. What about the Sabbath? I don't think the Sabbath was, was something that all nations and all people were supposed to do from the beginning of time. I think it was something God gave Israel as a symbol and picture of the rest that he was going to be providing for them if they would trust in him. It's fulfilled in Jesus. As a Christian, I'm not required to fulfill the Ten Commandments as a block. I am required to walk in morality and goodness and righteousness, which ends up overlapping with most of the Ten Commandments. But I, it's not like I say, well, nine I follow and one I don't. I don't say that. I say, I'm not under the Ten Commandments, right? Period. But this plays out in a way where I still absolutely do not murder and I, I don't have other gods before <laughs> before God and I don't want to lust 
I don't want to covet. I don't want to do all those things. <clears throat> Lie and steal. Um, it's just that it's not, it, it's the same way in which Abraham knew not to do those things, the same way in which Adam and Eve knew not to do those things. Does that make sense? The Ten Commandments isn't the same thing as just God's morality that he requires of all humanity. I I will probably get another question about it and explain it again someday. <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll start breaking through at one point. Um, by the way, let me just add this real quick. <clears throat> I'm not on a I'm on my own on the deep end here, okay? There's plenty of other Christian, serious Christian, respected uh, Christian teachers, pastors, theologians who would 100% agree this is not like Mike's own private opinion about the Ten Commandments. This is this is just something people never talk about. So it feels weird to them when they go, wait, wait, what? These are new ideas. Number 14, uh, Large Marge sent me, <clears throat> maybe my favorite YouTube channel name right there, <laughs> at least at the moment. As believers, we are given a static set of spiritual gifts. Are we given, excuse me, a static set of spiritual gifts or are our gifts more dynamic in nature so that God adds and or subtracts them according to our season of life or maturity in him? Um, I think that I my answer is going to be maybe a little disappointing here and just say that I don't know that there's a rule one way or the other. Like, I think that unless scripture dictates that my gifts are a, um, like the only verse you could, I could see you quoting for this would be the, the gifts and calling of God are, are irrevocable. Um, <clears throat> but was that talking about spiritual gifts in the sense that you're talking about? No, that passage was not. When the scripture says the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, it's talking about God's promises to Israel. These were promises. They're not just gifts, like spiritual gifts. Like, hey, I gave you a gift. God gave the kingdom, right, to Saul and then took it away and gave it to David. But God never promised Saul that he would always have this everlasting kingdom. But God did promise things to Abraham and he promised things to Israel. Those things are irrevocable. So <clears throat> if the gift is connected to a promise, yeah, it's irrevocable. But can God, you know, give you a gift of, say, healing that works for a season and then you no longer have that gift? If, if, if that's even how healing works, there's a whole debate on that, right? Like, is, does a person carry the gift of healing? Does, can God give you a gift of being prophetic and speaking prophecy and then later on you're not doing that? Why, why couldn't he? Why is it that God is restrained to only give you a thing for one time? Could he also give it to you for your whole life? Why not? I don't really see why we would make rules about this. An example of this, though, <clears throat> that might support the idea that God can, for a time, give you a gift and then not afterwards, is seen in the, the disciples themselves. Because they, like Paul's probably the best example, massive, amazing miracles were happening through the ministry of Paul. To the point where they took like his handkerchief and people who touched it got healed his handkerchief. He's not even there. They just see that this is connected to Paul and Paul's connected to the gospel and they're believing in Jesus and Jesus is doing massive miracles. Keep in mind, Paul never sold bottles of holy water. Paul never sold handkerchiefs to people and special prayer cloths. And he didn't sit there like one YouTube false prophet who gets up and prays, puts up pictures of himself praying over oil and water and all these napkins and then he's going to sell them to people. That guy... He'll get what he deserves. <laughs> um, so that is never what Paul did, right? Like Paul didn't 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 create a handkerchief selling operation, but it didn't last. This is the important thing. Paul's healing ministry didn't continue forever. There were great miracles done, especially when he brought the gospel to a new place, because he writes about it. like Corinth. You were there. You saw the miracles that God did. But then, and the best example of this is Timothy, or excuse me, Epaph Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, who he left sick in Miletus, meaning Paul was, it wasn't his handkerchief, Paul himself was with this guy. And this guy was really sick, and they were worried he was going to die. Paul continued his missionary journey and left him sick. Obviously, that same healing ministry was not taking place all the time with Paul. It was something the Holy Spirit did to demonstrate the truth of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit can is sovereign to choose when the gift will work, when the gift will not be there for the purposes of God, not for the person to just walk around and be like, I always have this thing and I can always 
touch the water and sell it to you for 20 bucks a bottle. It's going to change the world. <laughs> anyway, all right, number 15. <clears throat> Nigel Hendricks says, my cousin is dating someone who is not a Christian in the hopes that they will get saved. Is this okay to do? No. <laughs> um, no. Um, and no, it's, it's not. Uh, now, maybe they end up getting saved, and that's amazing. And then your cousin will probably take this as proof that they were right. See, I was right. I was right. Um, <clears throat> this is like marriage evangelism. <laughs> Um, more often than not, and this is important because statistics matter. Occasionally someone gets saved this way. More often than not, what happens is the kids are lost. They get married. They learn to just live with their different beliefs until they have kids. And then mom or whoever the Christian is says, I really want these, uh, these kids of mine to be raised in Christian ways. And dad's like, I ain't going to stand for that. And it becomes a battle. And either they both fall silent and the kids are left floating in anonymity, spiritual anonymity. They don't know what's going on in the world. Or the battle goes on. And frequently, as, as a guy that's done so much youth ministry, almost every single time I saw a kid who had a Christian parent and a non-Christian parent, if you ask the kid, what do you believe? They would say, well, I like agree with both of them. Because the unanimity of parents and their spiritual beliefs is the initial foundation for kids in their spiritual beliefs. If you love the guy you're dating and you just want to be with him or the girl you're dating and you just want to be with them and you're like thinking, I can handle it, I can handle it. I'm telling you, your kids cannot. That matters. You probably should care about your kids even before you have them. Um, scripture also tells us not to be unequally yoked, which I think an application of that is that we shouldn't be joined to someone who's a non-believer. When Paul talks about who a woman can marry if she's <clears throat> if she's a widow, right? He he has a qualification. It's in First Corinthians seven, is it, or is it Romans? I don't remember. But he says only in the Lord. They can only in the Lord that she can marry. Let me just see if I can find it. I'll show you the verse because nobody ever thinks about this verse, and it's in it's it's in the Bible. It's in a it's in the Bible. It's in a place. There's a verse. And it has words that are in lots of other verses, so it makes it really hard to search. <laughs> okay, here it is. First Corinthians seven thirty nine. <clears throat> A wife is bound to her husband as long as she lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes. Only in the Lord. Now, it's interesting at the time, ancient Jewish um, teaching, and it would even be on like a marriage certificate type thing in their teaching, is that if a, a, a Jewish woman, if her husband dies, she can marry whoever she wants as long as he's Jewish. That was their qualification. Paul doesn't care about the barriers between Jews and Gentiles, but he absolutely cares that whoever they marry, it's married in the Lord, only in the Lord. Now, you might want to argue, oh, well, that's only the policy for widows. God, <laughs> how do you argue this? God cares that widows only marry Christians. But if you're not a widow, if it's your first spouse, God doesn't care who you marry. You could marry a Buddhist atheist, Muslim, you could marry the, a mushroom worshiper. It doesn't matter. Um, and it really does matter. Like that's, that's, that's silly. We're obviously missing the heart of God on that issue. Only in the Lord. That's the rule for Christians. Lego Lucify says, Hey, Pastor Mike, what's your take when unbelievers ask, what would you do if your child came out to be gay? Any thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Um, I think that this is such a baited question. This is like one of those things where they're you're just they're just trying to get you in trouble with what you say, and you're just trying to get out of trouble with what you say. <laughs> and so, what would you do if your child came out gay? Well, I mean, I would talk to my kid. Like, <clears throat> you know, the, the the right answer is that I don't care what you think. I mean, this is I would be straight with you guys. I don't care what you think about what I say to my kid. 
if they come out to me as gay. I care what my kid thinks and what they're going through and the situation they've got. They've got several beliefs that are rattling around in their head, most likely that I'm gonna wanna address. One of them is that homosexuality is their identity. That's what coming out, coming out is based on the fundamental lie that your sexual proclivities are your core identity. That's why I'm coming out. I don't come out as someone who's, who like, I love, I, I really like cats. Like, I mean, cats are cool. I, I have cats. Cats are cool. I like cats, dogs, whatever. Just, just not a bird in a cage. The only pet I don't like. Um, I mean, I like the pet. I just don't like the cage. So that isn't my identity. Okay. That's not my identity. My identity is in Christ. My identity is human. My identity is male. And my calling in relation to females and males is related to me, my maleness. So I recognize that. But <clears throat> Homosexuality, so seeing it as an identity is a massive issue that's going to cause a lot of harm. I care about that. I care about my kid's own heart that they're thinking I'm going to hate them for it. Although hopefully if I've done a good job as a parent, they wouldn't think that. Hopefully. But so I might want to navigate that first and tell them, hey, son, daughter, I love you. I'm so glad that you felt comfortable enough. I'm honored that you felt comfortable to talk to me about this. You know, tell me what's going on. Maybe I'll just ask him a dozen questions before I say anything, just to keep building the bridge and keep the communication open. But the thing is that in our culture, if someone in public asks you, what would you say if your, your child comes out? What they're really doing is they're judging your answer to see if they can come at you with your answer or if they'll go, okay, all right, I, 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 I got that Christian's okay. It's all just so they could judge your behavior. <laughs> it's very judgy, the whole thing. Um, there's other things going on. Like I want to know if my kid... How old are they? They're coming out at what, 11 years old? Have they been sexually active? Why do they think they're gay? Have, have they been sexually active? Have they been exposed to pornography online? This is a big red flag. Any kid at that age talking about those types of things, something's wrong. Right? There's big issues going on. There's all kinds of things that I want to do. But I'm <clears throat> more deeply aware that these people don't care about me or my kid. They're just trying to lay a trap. <laughs> That's really all it is. All right, number 17. Um, the like button says, what is your best, what is the best way to focus on God? Do you know any techniques for this? While I'm praying, I try to focus on God, but I always seem to get distracted. Oh yeah, I, I fully understand that. Um, in, in the weakness of my humanity, I fully understand that. Um, things that help me are um, prayer lists, like, you know, you, you actually have a list of things you want to pray for that just keeps me on track, keeps me on target. Um, something else that helps me is worship. Uh, worship, see, the, the nature of a worship song is such that it kind of breaks through a little bit of that natural, like, wandering distraction of my mind because I'm just, I'm singing an actual song to the Lord that has, like, a cadence and it has a time period that it takes to sing the song. That activity can be a, a purposeful, directed activity towards the Lord. Uh, written prayers, pre-prepared prayers are also usable, like the Lord's Prayer. When I find myself getting distracted in prayer, I will often just stop and pray the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I just pray the Lord's Prayer um, as a way of refocusing myself there, you know, and I'll apologize. Lord, I'm sorry I'm getting distracted. Like, how irreverent of me. So those are some things that I've found to be helpful <clears throat> Other things that could be helpful for your prayer life is not having your phone on in your hands while you're praying, <laughs> not having any screen in front of you or any other kind of distraction in front of you when you're praying. Um, that could be helpful as well. I'm sure if you're if you just get real serious about having real serious prayer, you will have ideas that come to your own mind that will benefit that as well. Because when we really care about something, we suddenly become very creative in ways to make it happen. Number eighteen, Josh. Uh, excuse me, Josue. <clears throat> Josue Anaya says, what are your thoughts about wearing cross jewelry? Um, I, I have no prejudgment about it. Um, I think wearing cross jewelry kind of depends on you. So like once I, I, I used to have a cross that uh, my, my grandmother had given me, right? It was like the only piece of jewelry I have was like 17 or 16 or something. And um, the youth pastor of the church asked me about it one time and he was like mike why do you wear that cross <laughs> and i was like oh uh oh uh oh it's a pastor quiz um and i remember telling him well like it represents what jesus did for me he died on the cross for me and he goes 
all right, good answer. You know, and that was that was the end of that discussion. But I remember feeling that like, oh, uh oh, I'm being quizzed. If I had answered that I thought the cross was protecting me, that would be a, a, a superstitious thing that I shouldn't probably fall into. If I had answered that I thought the cross just looked cool, that would be um, irreverent to Christ. The cross is literally, uh, let's get this in mind, a device for slowly killing someone. It's like an electric chair, but it takes longer. It's like having a torture rack of some kind on a necklace or in your jewelry. Why would I wear this unless I am fully you know, cognizant of the fact that this is, this is how Jesus died for me. He suffered and died for me. This represents that. Now, if I'm wearing it because I think it just looks cool and looks pretty, I'm probably missing the point of the cross. That seems irreverent to me. Otherwise, I don't take a prejudgment. I'm more interested, like, you know, when, <clears throat> when people wear these gaudy crosses, people who aren't even Christians, they're not following Jesus, and they're wearing crosses because, it, I don't know, makes them feel kind of spiritual. That's irreverent, but it's not the worst thing they got going on in their lives, spiritually speaking. Um, but yeah, why would, you, why would you bother? Now, I don't wear a, a cross or any jewelry uh, other than my wedding ring. And th that's, that's all I currently do. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those are some thoughts. Hope you find something insightful there. All right, let's go to question number 19. Ben Rebman says, My wife works very hard, long hours. She frequently comes home exhausted and stressed. My job is fairly stress-free, and I work from home. I feel like I'm not doing enough for her. What should I do? Ben, ask your wife. Ask your wife, man. <clears throat> like, what, what else can I do that would bless you, honey, that would help you? Because we go through seasons, and sometimes they're very long. Sometimes they're years long seasons where work is hard and work is longer than it should be and it's taken a toll um so yeah the, the other thing is like as for, for all of us married people you know when you look at your spouse you can learn them really well if you just pay good attention to them like you learn when they wake up in the morning with just a glance you could tell how they slept not just because the bags in their eyes which is like my primary indicator for for my face but but you can tell because you've got like the way that they sighed, the way they just looked at you. You know what I mean? You just, you, you learn each other really well. So Ben, there's, ask yourself this question. Like, you know your wife, like what can you do to make things easier for her, to help her out? Um, it, it, whether that's cooking or cleaning things or if that's creating space for things that, that make her life easier as she said she's so stressed out and working so much I, like man I, I don't know i would think that your brain contains in it wonderful ideas on how to bless and help your wife right now as she's going through this uh season however long it's going to be where she comes home exhausted and stressed you, know, you could also like just make a ton of money so she doesn't have to go to that job that might it's easier said than done <laughs> but i'm sure that would be an ideal an ideal scenario um and, and if things are really bad, you know, you guys could look at cutting back your costs, your expenses, your lifestyle, so that the the workload doesn't have to be that big. That's hard to do. It's hard to do for us to do that. But quality of life is not uh, primarily based on quantity of money. Yeah. Last question for today. This is from Charles McNamara, who says, <clears throat> if scripture tells me to glorify God with all I do, how can I glorify God when taking a math class, playing checkers, eating a meal, listening to Beethoven, etc., if these are morally neutral? Um, <clears throat> I guess I'd have two thoughts on this. Let's, let's find a scripture that, that, that talks about this. Um, in uh, Colossians, is it 3.17? Yeah. In Colossians 3.17, it says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. <clears throat> now, part of me wants to answer the question by saying, there's a way to play checkers under the Lord. There's a way to take a math class under the Lord, to eat a meal, or to listen to Beethoven unto the Lord. And I think there's a truth to this that I want to highlight. Right? Like, let's say checkers. Okay. Am I, I'm playing checkers. Am I playing with good sportsmanship? 
Am I playing in a way that cares about the other person? Am I playing in a way where checkers doesn't overtake my schedule in a way the game is to, overtaking my schedules in a way that I'm abandoning other responsibilities? Like those are actually all morally good things to consider when you're playing a game. And they can be ways of doing that game to honor the Lord. But you can also just play checkers and be like, Lord, you made this ability of mine to just play fun games and have a good time. And I'm grateful for it. And I thank you for it. And you're just sort of aware of God as being the source of the enjoyment you're having ultimately. So there's a way to do it on the Lord. What about like taking a math class? Oh yeah, well, how about you like show up on time to the class and you work hard at it and you try to achieve really well because you're gonna do it under the Lord. Like it's for Jesus you're taking the class. So you do it with integrity. When someone gives you the cheat notes for the test, you're like, nah, nah, can't do that. I'm doing this class under the Lord. So there's a way to do that as well. Eating a meal, well, like I pray and thank the Lord for my food. I'm giving God thanks for my food, so I'm literally giving thanks, like the verse says right there. So that's kind of like a way in which I could be doing it under the Lord, right? I think that that's legit. Um, and listening to Beethoven. Now, for me, I mean, I okay, I, maybe I seem a little weird. Let me let me tell you a conversation I had with my wife this morning. Um, I don't know what brought what it what caused it to be brought up, but the idea of eyesight was brought up. And I was just talking about how I think eyesight is like a superpower. And I'm just blown. I mean, I mean, like legitimately and honestly, I'm not saying this for any other reason. I just completely am blown away by the fact that I can see things far away using photons that are flying through the air. And I can perceive depth and texture and color and distance and not only that, I can actually piece all these little particles in my brain, piece it all together to form like objects, recognizable objects. I could see my mother's face and I know it's her. This blows my mind, right? Like the fact that I have vision at all blows my mind or that you do or any of us do. It's like a superpower. Imagine if you encountered a planet of blind people who never had vision and you told them, that you could see them all coming from a long distance away. You could recognize them without them using any words or any indication of who they are. You could just you could just know from a distance which one they were, where they were at, what they looked like, how tall they were, how big their nose was, how long it had been since they shaved. Like you knew all this stuff. Vision is amazing. When I just acknowledge that God designed and gave me that, I'm giving glory to God. When I live my whole life and never thank him for it, I'm failing to do that. <clears throat> music is like that. Music is indescribably good. And when you listen to Beethoven, whether or not his song is deliberately, intentionally glorifying God, you are aware God made music. He caused the birds to sing. He created the math that runs the universe, that runs music as well. He built it all on these structures so that you have these like eight, you know, you've got these eight, you know, uh, keys and all this. <clears throat> all, actually, you've got a lot of things going on with music and all the interconnectedness of the math and the 440 and the A. And then you've got it's just really interesting stuff. And it touches the heart and it touches the head and you give God glory for it. And you're like, Beethoven's amazing. Thank you, Lord, that you made music. Because all we're doing is it, is we're grabbing the things that it's like Legos. We're Legos are you're able to make all kinds of things out of Legos because Legos are well designed. You can do amazing things with Legos because they're well designed. Music is like that. God designed tonality and sound in such a way that you're able to make amazing things out of it because of how He designed it. So you get some credit for making something cool, but He, he actually designed the thing that makes the stuff that you are listening to. So <clears throat> you can do all that. That's the first thing I would say is this. You can honestly give God glory uh, and thanks and do things under the Lord that you might think are mundane or morally neutral. But the second thing I want to say is this, is I don't think that scripture was intending with these verses that I've left on the screen for a very long time. I don't think that scripture was intending here to give us um, paranoia about every action you take so that you could, you could become overly obsessed and concerned with somehow adding a spiritual element to every little piece of your life instead of just what scripture says, do it unto the Lord and be thankful. That's it. Do it unto the Lord. But you don't have to go, Lord, would, 
which cereal would most glorify you right now for me to I was going to pour this much milk in, but I might pour that much milk in. But which one of those would more glorify God? And it's like, no, just be thankful, you know, and and live. <laughs> I don't think God intends to create a paranoia in us. I, I hope that helps. Because some of us can go down that road. We think we're overthinking it. That's the term we use. Well, I'm just overthinking it. I'm overthinking. No, you're not. You're underthinking it because you missed the point. You're, you're see, you, you can't see the forest through the trees. I'm going to study this one tree. If they perfectly understand this tree, there's like this massive forest of just give God glory, give him thanks. Speaking of which, let's pray. Um, Lord, we're grateful for your goodness, for this eyesight we have, for the ears we've got that work. For those of us that have them that work, we're super, super grateful. Lord, we pray that thank you for music and for beauty and for all the things that you've given us to enjoy, even checkers and things like that, and games that are much more fun than checkers. <laughs> and we... We, uh, we lift up now those who are in Florida suffering from this hurricane and, and those all, all those being affected by the hurricane. We pray, Lord, for your protection, that you give them wisdom to know how to, how to keep themselves out of harm's way, help and rescue and aid from others, and spiritual, just supernatural aid and help right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that is all. I will see you guys soon. Oh, here's the quick update for the Women in Ministry series. I've just just about finished all my notes. For what will probably be, I mean, it might be the longest teaching I've ever done. <laughs> and it's going to be on head coverings. 1 Corinthians 11, head coverings. Because I decided to tackle this issue in great detail. All the debates. Um, and there are a massive number of debates because I'm doing this whole ministry, women in ministry series in great detail showing both sides. It's just incredibly involved. And there's so many different issues to cover. And my notes are so painfully long. There's no way I could do this as a live video. I don't think I could teach that long. <laughs> it's going to be that long, but I'll put timestamps in it so you guys can navigate to exactly what you need. You'll be able to find, you know, the questions. I'll, I'll you know, I'll structure it in a way that hopefully you could look at the timestamps and, and and either watch the whole thing or watch just the parts you need or just skip to the conclusion. But I'll get that uploaded after I get it recorded, which is after I create all the graphics in the stream. That's going to take hours and hours as well. So I'm working on it, and that is all. Yeah, have a wonderful day. Put your eyes upon Jesus and know that um, we do not labor in vain when we labor in the Lord.